Wiggle your fingers, wiggle your toes Bend your knees and your elbows And look and see If everybody is doing it too Just like you Stop hopping up and down with your arms to the side Then flap them up and down like a butterfly And look and see if everybody is doing it too Just like you and welcome to the Barnes Children's Literature Festival at home. My name is Demet and I've been volunteering with the festival since 2016. Here with me today is 16 year old Dara McAnulty, who wrote the smash hit debut, Diary of a Young Naturalist, which was a BBC Radio 4 book of the week. And joining him in conversation is Laura St. John, author of the One Dollar Horse Mystery Series and the Wolf and Lamb Mystery Series. She's also a patron of the Born Free Foundation and Main Chance Horse Sanctuary. Give them a big applause and enjoy. Hi. Well, it's time, I have to say, a particular um, honor and joy for me to be talking to Dara because um, his uh, book, Diary of a Young Naturalist, completely blew me away. I and mean, it's, uh, well, for me, it's an intro instant classic of nature writing but it's a it's a book um all of you I, I i would like to be sitting down to read it again right from the start having never um, started it before because it's um the experience of reading it was so magical and i and my first thought on finishing it is i wish a book like that had existed when i was growing up and i i think you must hear that a lot Dara, I mean, what it, it, it as all of you will find when you read it, it's it's a book that's so rich and works on so many levels because it's um, on the one hand it's a nature diary, a diary of yeah. of a season of seasons, nature through the seasons. It's a beautiful portrait of a family. I mean, nobody could read this book and not fall in love with your family. <laughs> <laughs> and I mean, it's a beautiful coming of age story. Um, what's I think when I when I read it, I, I knew that I would just want to, it's a book like uh, that I would want to read over and over. Um, well, I will read it over and over because you <laughs> get so much out of it. Or, um, just pick it up at random. Um, when is the first um, time that you started writing down your experience, writing, writing about nature? Um, so I started writing quite early on. Like as soon as I, I was basically writing or drafting or anything that I could do, I was like, I was constantly um, expressing um, like exactly what was going on in my head in any way possible. <laughs> And before I could write, it was done by speaking to anybody who would listen, <laughs> <laughs> which kind you kind of struggle to find people after you talk to them for about a solid hour on exactly um, on exactly why on the exact um, distribution of red squirrels, <laughs> um, and writing was just a way that I could express what was going on in my head, all these facts and feelings and emotions I can really understand and then not have to talk to someone, mm -hmm. <laughs> which is not really, like people have, a, people, um, you can't really predict how a pe person's going to react to something, but I can react how a page is going to react, um, how a page is going to change when I put a pen to it. And I know it's not going to jump around and eat me or, or tell, or a page isn't going to tell me that 
what you're doing is wrong, go back, go back. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and I could just really express myself and push myself into that medium. So I, I once, there's, there's a quote I once read by a writer that, that I think about so often, which is, how can I know what I think until I see what I say? And that's often, I mean, you write, you write beautifully. You, you capture a lot through the book. I'm really struck by a certain things that you say, which is exactly how I feel about writing or about nature, which is like at one point you say, you know, what started as scribbles and scratches on the page has grown into an essential shape of my days. Yeah. Do you ever find that when you're writing, that that's something you haven't really been able to coherently put into thought suddenly becomes clearer once you start to write it? Um, well, I can't understand anything. Is nothing's coherent until I write it down. Mm. Oh, well, that's that's really really interesting. It's a, almost an essential part of my processing. Mm. Write it down. Otherwise, I just don't understand. It's like um, even when I'm, like, I've got to explain it, I've got to even I've got to, it, like even when I'm doing maths problems. Mm -hmm. I, I have to either write it out exactly mm -hmm. what my plan is for solving it or say it out loud. Mm -hmm. Otherwise I can never solve it. And it's just this almost abstract, that I can't really grasp. Like I remember I was doing uh, some of my maths homework um, yesterday and I just could not get it. It was um, a Venn diagram and I was trying to work out the probabilities on the in of two different things happening at the same time and I I was like going oh the power paradoxes and it was weird <laughs> that's and, how I am with maths <laughs> um but eventually the solution I was just speaking it out in all of the different steps and I was mm -hmm. writing down notes and was scribbling in the margin like a <laughs> and eventually I got it and, and mm -hmm. a massive moment of revelation going oh I've been really, really dumb about this. I've been like trying to solve this as a continuous step by step. Instead, I need to solve it all at once. <laughs> and but but yeah, I have to write it or speak about it to understand it. What I love at, at a certain when was your earliest um, memory of of nature being a source a huge source of comfort for you because you write about imagining sometimes a canopy of leaves above your head ca mm -hmm. a canopy of leaves above your head protecting you from the world which i i thought was such a beautiful way of putting it and do you have a sense of when that sort of started for you well the first one was probably yeah, it is in the book it's the blackbird oh. i open up the book with it and the blackbird is, so I'm really, really young. I can't, mm -hmm. I am trying to remember exactly what age I, I mm -hmm. am. But um, you can see this, the shadow of the blackbird um, on, that's ca being cast onto the curtain and I'm looking at the shadow and then I run downstairs to the kitchen mm -hmm. to look out and just to make sure that the blackbird mm -hmm. is actually there and it's not just a disembodied shadow. And I think that's probably one of the earliest memories mm -hmm. I have, aside from picking up feathers, mm -hmm. the conquerors, um, climbing trees, mm -hmm. uh, much higher than I probably should. <laughs> and that was one really, really important thing was that my parents didn't say, no, 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 don't do that. Mm -hmm. And they said, it was only when I got to a certain height, they'd be going, Are you, do you want to come down now? <laughs> <laughs> and I think that sense of letting me go wild and free was really important for my development and being able to pick up feathers without being told, uh, no, don't pick them up, they're dirty. <laughs> mm. um, and I don't see how anybody could call them dirty. Like, I haven't died yet. <laughs> in my entire life picking up feathers <laughs> um and i'm still here <laughs> like i think if there was any disease on feathers i would have caught it by now <laughs> yeah i i completely agree i was always picking up everything and i found i showed you i found this yes 
yeah. there in the field yesterday, yesterday and it's yeah. just lovely and I keep stroking it. Yeah. And, but the funny thing about blackbirds, I was out walking this morning and, the, and the, I, I love, uh, people always go on about uh, blackbirds and how beautiful their song is, but the uh, thing that, that makes me laugh is they're always making that alarm call. There's this sort of the funny yeah. alarm call. That's, they call. They, they, they're quite excitable, actually, which mm. nobody ever really seems to. Yeah. To I'm going to read um, uh, this. Uh, I mean, I could literally sit here reading uh, beautiful extracts from this book all day long because there's just so many of them. But um, I'll, I'll read this particular passage as you're about to move house. And, and obviously, there's, it's oh, for all of you. There's, yeah. there's so many mixed emotions to do oh, with we've, we've the We've got the added part of the book. It's like <laughs> we're going real and deep. <laughs> it's. Um, no, it's a beautiful. I love. I love this because I. I also. I love the sort of democracy of your family. How everyone gets listened to, and then yeah. before you leave, that everyone gets the to have a last adventure. And this. Yeah. I like the descriptions of your car journeys as well. That you know, the 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 some people listening to punk, some people listening to <laughs> yeah. Animal Pony. <laughs> it's just, yeah, it's... it's absolutely joyous. But in this particular passage, you're. Um, it's it's really close to when you're one of the last days before you leave, and um, there's so many kind of mixed emotions of leaving this house, and um, and you know you've got to to think about the new house and and that that you you'll be sharing um, with your brother and the compromises of space and everybody's going to have to make so. Um, um, but then at the same time, what's giving you comfort still is bits of nature. Oh, oh you know. This beautiful description. There's a robin that sings right outside the window. A new palette of sound, which is so lovely. But then um, we are gathered in the kitchen for breakfast, playing a constellation memory game. When Mum shouts, "Red squirrel!" Our chairs scrape the kitchen floor simultaneously as we push ourselves up and rush to the window. We don't see anything save a lone blue tit at the at the bird feeder. Then an unfamiliar face breaks from the shadows of the trees. Its small shape jerks forward on the grass, stopping, watching, leaping, stopping, watching, leaping. There it is, a red squirrel. I stare in disbelief to see it stray from the woods into the suburban place. I reach for my camera because no one will believe us. It's there in plain sight, bounding through our wildflower patch, scrambling up the trees and across the branches, an effortless acrobatic display, its russet body and exuberant bouncing tail, swinging from tree to tree until it's out of sight. When everyone else is gone, I'm still rooted to the floor. Joy gives way to melancholy as I return to the echoes of the kitchen, the emptiness. In less than two weeks, this will no longer be my home. New people will move in and, and they will not love it like we do. They just won't. I go out and immediately feel how much colder the air is this morning. I sit among the chattering fledglings and watch the hoverflies and bees reading on carmen, catmint, um, oxide da daisy, cow parsley. I breathe in all the memories and feel swollen with emotion. The green finches have just returned alongside a charm of goldfinches. Flames of our mini forest, flames in our hearts. I feel an ache and lie down on the grass to watch the screeching swifts. My body sinks. I want nothing more than to sink underground. I think this is so incredibly powerful because it describes all of the conflicting emotions of moving and leaving a place, and yeah. but also the momentary joys, and then yeah, and then the the shadows creeping in. I yeah. guess, and that entry starts off the sort of downward cycle of summer <laughs> mm -hmm. and it slowly gets worse and worse and worse until i finally get a rooting of the in the land in where i am now in county down mm -hmm. and it, i i basically was completely lost up until that point i was bare i was not re i was not sleeping i was having really bad insomnia i'm not entirely sure if i talk about that in the book but i was getting like one hour or two hours of sleep a night <laughs> mm. um and ev everything was kind of falling apart for me 
And I think it just kind of showed how much I'm basically reliant on nature <laughs> mentally. <laughs> and that whenever I I lose it, everything falls apart for me. Mm -hmm. I can relate to that so much. And I think so many people that really love nature can. And I think yeah. the other thing that, that that's a, that's well. I, I mean, you were, was it hard for you to be as honest as you were about your emotions and in, in the book? Um, like sometimes it was sort of hard, mm. but you, I kind of came to the realization that if I didn't, the book wouldn't feel right. Mm -hmm. I think that's com completely right. But mm. how did you, how did you keep because? You know, I, I I asked you a couple of months ago because I was so blown. Up, well, not a couple of months, a month ago, whenever it was, that on Twitter that um, what struck me is I know how much when I wrote my first book, which I, I was twenty two, and I really battled with it. I I sort of went along for uh, initially really really confidently, and then I kind of showed people a few pages, and then they all had good and bad things to say and I really lost a lot of confidence and it was really hard for me to start up again. So, but also finding time, I mean, it will take so much time and you were juggling school, you were, yeah. you know, how, how did you, I'm kind of in awe that you did that. How did you manage to keep all the balls in the air as it were? Um, maybe that may also have like, been a reason for lack of sleep. Yes. <laughs> 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 yeah <laughs> i was doing a lot of things at the same time i was i was also at that later on i was also setting up an eco school group in my school and then i was and then i kind of just like had to i just because sometimes i would get behind on my diary entries and and the writing schedule that I had set out for myself, mm -hmm. and I would just shut myself off for a couple of days mm -hmm. <laughs> and just write and not do, take on any extra stuff mm -hmm. and just write for um, a couple of days <laughs> and then try and fit in other stuff because I think if I spent all my time writing the book, Mm -mm. then I wouldn't be having because I was writing it in sort of nearly mm -mm. Real time mm. if I was doing spending all my time writing the book mm -mm. The diary I would wouldn't have anything to write about mm -mm. <laughs> no it's, it's completely true and that's the weird part of being a writer I think that's why novelists and particularly um certain types of novelists particularly struggle you know the ones that that spend all their time kind of locked in a garret and don't really get out into the world because it, in the end they're like, what do you write about if you're not out? Yeah, out in the world. But no, yeah. it's it, it's really um, amazing. And I mean, they. I think also I was struck by um, you've got this wonderful um, observation on which I thought was really um, profound. Um, let me just page. Uh, great. The very moment that I need to do, I'm sorry, uh, I just write this. Oh, that's what I was going to ask you as well while well, I'm just looking at this one passage. Um, is how did um, how do you keep notes? Because because it's so beautifully detailed. Have you just got an amazing memory, or or how do you keep notes? So my notebooks are scattered, random. Mm -hmm. not very well organized it's um i've got like five different notebooks and i just gra usually just grab the first one to hand mm -hmm. <laughs> whenever i'm doing writing and and then i kind of like craft sculpt into something that's marginally decent <laughs> um from the notes and experiences mm -hmm. i'm feeling and but my memory's a bit strange I found because I can't re I cannot remember things directly after they've happened for some reason. Like there's multiple times when the school bell is gone. Mm -hmm. I have no idea that the school bell is gone because I've instantly forgotten that it went. <laughs> <laughs> but then I'll remember ten minutes later. Oh my word! The school bell has just went, <laughs> and I've kind of got like this delayed memory. 
and um, sometimes I've I, I will remember something a year later, <laughs> like a couple of years later, and then go, oh, I remember that. <laughs> um, but I can I can hardly remember what I did last week. <laughs> but I find I find the whole memory thing really interesting because I've written a few biographies on people, and that's what and what I've found is everybody has different types of memory. So yeah. some people very vividly remember like taste, touch, smell. Those um, um, some people have amazing memory for like dialogue, you know, conversations. Some people have quite an anecdotal memory; they remember little um, vignettes of stories and things like that so it's it's quite interesting all the different ways that people remember things but it doesn't come across like that, that in your book you just i uh, just it, it's so beautifully detailed and i think one of the things that that i love most about it is that your celebration of the things that people often miss so i grew up in zimbabwe in africa on a farm and game reserve and um you know, when people come to our, to tourists, often when they come to Africa, they they're obsessed with seeing the big five. You know, so they want to see lions and leopards and elephants and rhinos and and um, uh, um, cave buffalo. And then, so we try to say to them, well, what about the small five? You know, what about um, elephant shrews and buffalo weaver birds and, <laughs> and rhino beetles and um, um, ant lions? You know, we try. But because there's so many, you know, um, you know, this morning when I was walking and I feel like the same if I go to home to Zimbabwe, like if you just take a meter of ground, you, you will know this more, better than anyone. Um, mm. If you take a go outside into you don't even have to be in a in a, in a field or, or anywhere really particularly wild. If you just take a meter of earth, the amount of things going on in that. Yes. And you do see us a lot it's that every like we've had put out some sunflower hearts i don't know why we haven't done this before <laughs> because sunflower hearts seem to just like be the draws in all of the birds <laughs> we've had about gold finches have just mm -hmm. started storming us um siskins um, oh, wow. and we've had chicks and it's like <laughs> in like a week and we're like in constant fear of running out because there's so many <laughs> <using them. laughs> so sunflower hearts are a big recommendation if you want to see lots and lots of birds uh, <laughs> I don't know what it is I think they it's just easier for a lot of birds to eat because they don't have any shell on them but, they, they are crazy about sunflower hearts I yeah I, I have a paranoia as well about running out of bird, <laughs> bird food. Yeah. They they love any suet things as well, like oh, yeah. fat balls or like, suet pellets. Or... Like it's a constant fear. Every morning you wake up, you run down the stairs to make sure the bird seed is still there. <laughs> it's like... <laughs> <laughs> and then there's the, 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 the flocks of things that colonise, like the, the, the green parrots descended for a time and then... Yeah. And actually, they're beautiful, and I admire their ingenuity. But they do take over everything. Mm -hmm. But I like what. What are some of the the things that the creatures that you feel are really overlooked that you enjoy watching or seeing? Um. Well, my one of my favorite animals. Um. That isn't so. I'm. I love. Um. So. What would it be? Like I, I've got I kind of have to say hen harrier always. It's like my favorite animal of all time. Oh, wow. They're so beautiful, aren't they? I love them so much, and that was a big thing about leaving Fermanagh. Mm. I was leaving hen harrier territory, oh. and you don't get. And but we've got a different bird here that Sam. Not quite as good, but it's up there, and it actually, and that's the red kite. Oh, I love them! And this, and they were reintroduced here about must have been 10 years ago. And I remember it so well because the RSPB came to our primary school to tell mm -hmm. us about the reintroduction program. 
And it was actually that moment that got me obsessed with raptors. <laughs> <laughs> like that was the big moment for me was seeing this. And I spent, I think they couldn't get me off the computer looking up pictures of birds <laughs> for the rest of the day. <laughs> and yeah. But this seems like to me. I mean, this is this is what education should be about. I think we're looking all the wrong places for how to educate people. I'm really not. I, what what uh, I'm going to read this passage in a minute. But I bet you know you talk. What you're saying here is what I've sort of been thinking for years, which is I don't understand why our education system, as the world's changed and as climate change and the sixth extinction, all these things are kind of bearing down on us, and we're still teaching. I thought from when I was growing up, we had a lot of conservation taught, taught in schools in Zimbabwe. Mm -hmm. and lots of our projects were on conservation. And when I arrived here, it was really a mystery to me that that, that conservation is not like a critical part of the curriculum or yeah. until recently. My, I was like, I was really struggling with my GCSE biology for that exact reason. And because I think we spent about a week on ecology and it was pretty lazy. It was not very good ecology course. Mm -mm. That like I was getting like, they were just like, a um, this is a quadrat and you can count all the stuff inside the quadrat. And it's just like, I want some interesting mm -mm. systems and connections and all of the intricacies of the natural world, not, this um almost very base and simple but then they'll ask this real like this is this was the story of gcse for me it was basically um really uh like the the stuff that they were asking in biology was really s simple to understand but the questions that they were asking were so awkward <laughs> it was like they're trying to almost replace good content in the course with like it was not very good and i was i was getting very demoralized by it well nobody can it. Else, so. I, i'll just read the set what you've written about schools in your book like <laughs> school and because i think it's so true i mean i just agree with every word and uh schools can be extremely bad places to learn if you're autistic Filtering out noise can be impossible. Focusing and concentrating requires so much energy. I'm exhausted by 3.30 p.m. Yes, yet I must come home and do homework, then set my alarm and do it all the, again the next day. I have to work so much harder than other typical students, but it has to be done because I want to be a scientist. I want to go to university. The hoops must be jump, jumped through. Apparently it makes us stronger, better citizens. I'm not so sure. When I think of all the technological advances humankind has made over the last hundred years, I feel confused the way that we, way we are educated has stayed the same, more or less the same, with rows of bodies sat rigidly behind desks, sitting still, putting up a hand to talk, unless it's a teacher-directed debate, quite rare in my experience, yet we accept it. Why? Conformity, obedience, duty. I think it's so interesting. and. Do, how, if you could um, change anything about the way kids are taught, what what would you do differently in schools? Okay then. So first of all, just as a baseline, mm -hmm. we need um, in primary schools because in primary schools that's where you get your base understanding of the world. Put science on somewhere on the curriculum, for goodness' sake. That's such a good idea. Like, um bring back nature walks because i don't think i think i went on like two nature walks in seven years what in primary school oh my goodness um and i remember very specifically that we were doing there was um it's all transfer test focus here because we have this i don't know um if you have it um but we have this test to get into grammar schools and you have to pass it to get into the grammar mm -hmm. school. Mm -hmm. And everything in the primary school curriculum is focused on that. And because only maths and English are tested on it, 
there's no science. I remember they were given a booklet and they said, cross out the science that's not on the transfer test. <laughs> I did it anyway, but... <laughs> oh my goodness, that's just crazy. Yeah. But do you think a, a move towards a, a, a more, um, I don't know, forest schools, outdoor learning, do you think that would help? Yes. And just being able to give students something interesting to be doing mm -hmm. instead of just doing maths and English every single day, repeated again and again and again and again with very little diversity. Just getting you up to that transfer test, getting your SAT scores, mm -hmm. up, all this testing, testing, which I don't, I, I disagree with the whole testing in primary school as well. Mm -hmm. Because, like, this is a time for them to be developing. And you're already setting them, putting them into boxes of how they're going to live their lives before they've even hit their teenage years. <laughs> I, I find it incredible because I mean I left school really young. I left school when I was sixteen, which I which I don't recommend to anybody. But I mean I had no idea what I wanted to do beyond sort of vague, uh, vague. I vaguely wanted to I don't know sing or maybe I want to be a vet or maybe I want to be an Olympic Olympic eventer or something. But you know it took time for me to figure out what I wanted to do with my life, and then I became a journalist and ultimately a writer but yeah you know i think people change and grow and and to it's just absolutely crazy to expect you know people kids to figure that stuff out i mean some people do you know some people aged five decide oh, i want to be uh, a vet or a singer or whatever and then never you know never or a nurse and never change but you know some well i said i wanted to be an astronaut when i was <laughs> Five. Still time, Dara. Um, well, I'm colorblind, so that's never going to happen. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm not allowed to, to become an astronaut, and that was a that was a sad day. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, I've just um, it's it's an awkward sort of colorblindness because it makes I have to rely on my other senses for identification of birds quite a bit of the time. That's really interesting. Isn't it? Yeah. But, um. A green finch in a forest canopy is like, <laughs> where is that? <laughs> oh, really? Uh, yeah, I can only really see it until it moves. And I go, oh, there it is. <laughs> mm. I love that uh, description. I'll just see if I can find it in my um, my notebook. Is um, I, I can assure you. Is probably, this is my notebook, which is, um, this is how like chaotic. Wow. Book is because when I, was I like journalism, like when I was studying journalism, we we um we did something called T line shorthand, and so I but I I don't just write in that. I sort of mix it up with regular bad uh, writing, um, and so so it's generally illegible. But I wanted to. So. Well, if it's illegible to everybody else, then nobody can read your secret notes. Like... No, well, that was part of it as well. I thought I thought it would be a good idea. If... Yeah. Uh, yeah. Can I say yeah, I love um, your your mum when you when you there, there's a, a, a beautiful section in the book where you go to Scotland with your mum to to yeah. uh, to do some goshawk field uh, field work, and I really really love the section. But it's such a nice. Um, Thing when you're when you're on on your way and you're um, you're a bit anxious, understandably, and and um, your mum says to you, um, "You're among we're among kindreds," you know, meaning um, other bird lovers or compassionate mm -hmm. people. I thought that was such a, a beautiful way of putting it. And your um, both your parents are so remarkable, but your mum seems to have such a, a lovely way about her and putting yes. putting yeah. her ease in certain situations and. Mm -hmm. Like I would be going probably without her guidance, I would be probably teetering and collapsing. Because and I remember, like she's all through my life, she's really helped with um keeping me somewhat uh uh oh god. Tethered. Tethered, yes, that's a good word. Thank you. <laughs> that's where I was coming from. Going for um 
and I remember every single day that we used to have, I, it used to be that every single day had to be exactly planned out to the minute. Otherwise, mental breakdowns would ensue. Mm. And then my mum had the absolute genius idea um, of creating question mark days, days where we did not know what was going to happen. Oh, that's such a good idea, isn't it? And so if, uh, for the first, like, five, we were completely freak out. <laughs> Me and my brother were like... <gasps> <laughs> <laughs> um but then eventually we got used to them we and then maybe there was like the amount of question mark days increased and some days we were looking forward to question mark days because of being something new and exciting and then That's every day became a question a mark. Idea for anybody isn't it and then every day became a question mark day and so we become we we grew out of rigidness and became flexible so we weren't completely like because what would happen is if you if we had our, our all of our days this rigorously planned out if something yeah. didn't go exactly to plan mm -hmm. which in life does happen a lot mm -hmm. yes <laughs> um we would completely freak out <laughs> mm -hmm. and so being able to keep get us into this flexible state of mind was really really important for us so i'm eternally grateful for that one <laughs> that's such a lovely lovely way of looking at it but i i love this idea i mean do do you know um having just said that nobody knows what necessarily what they're going to do until they're much much older do you have an idea that when you're older what you'd like to sort of specialize in if you if, if you're a naturalist or if there's any area of anything that you would like to focus you want on to go into biology I haven't got any further than that. Okay. It changes every single day. <laughs> Good. I think that that's healthy, personally. <laughs> Some I days I want to become a psychologist. I want to go into psychology. Other days I want to just do research. Mm -mm. Other days I want to do... I, Some days I want to go into writing and just write stories for days upon end. Mm -hmm. Other days I just want to look at leaves mm -hmm. <laughs> and track the patterns on the veins of leaves and cross-section ad. Um, Mm. Other days, I want I I want to go into um, microbiology, and mm. ornithology, and it changes every single day. <laughs> I think personally, I think that's healthy, and I think um, I think it's healthy to change all through your life as well. And and like I love stories, and um, yeah. you know, uh, of people that suddenly decide to start studying medicine in their th their mid thirties mm. or something, and you know, because yeah. You know, I think follow your heart and follow your passions and that. And yeah, the only uh, thing I'm not probably not going to do is going to be become a surgeon because I couldn't take it mm. <laughs> or a vet. I don't actually think I could actually take it because you've got to like have emotionally, <laughs> you can't get emotionally, t sometimes you can't really get emotionally attached to. Mm. And I would, I would get so, I would be. And every single time I would just, I don't think I could like mentally deal with it. But I don't, I mean, I, I actually spent a year working as a veterinary nurse. So I, when I first came to England, I, I really wanted to be a vet for years. And, but, and I grew up on a farm. We had a massive, because we lived on a game reserve, we had this massive menagerie. So we had a, we had a pet giraffe. We had, at one time we had eight horses, eight um, dogs, six cats, two warthogs, a goat that we adopted from the RSBCA. We had all of these creatures, but you know, even whether you you have all those creatures or even now with the garden, this there's, there's so many mixed emotions. Like, yeah, you write very well. You know, on that at the goshawk um, trip that you talk about the field work, how or the the highs and lows of being a conservationist. Um, you know, just to give you an example, like where I've moved to, I moved to about six months ago, um, and I've created this massive bird sanctuary that is just a crazy number of birds, and and they're all so tame, and it's just such a daily joy. But a couple of weeks ago, um, there's a nest box, and I heard all the little babies start blue tip babies start tweeting. I was so happy. Then the next day the magpies managed to break open the box and I still haven't got over it and I 
I suppose there's so many, well, as you know, being, anything yeah. to do with nature, there's, so, there's all this balance. And how do you deal with yeah. that kind of mentally? Um, I kind of just have to say to myself that this is just the cycle. And yes. it's <laughs> And like I'll probably cry for a couple of days, mm -hmm. and I'll completely be um, complete train wreck for a couple of days mm -hmm. until I kind of somewhat can come back to my senses and go. Mm -hmm. and it gave the magpie, um, the magpie chicks got fed. Mm. Lovely magpie chicks, which are really cute. <laughs> I've never seen a magpie chick actually, but I can I actually cannot imagine them being cute. Um, and I really admire them. I mean they're so smart, but yeah. we've got one that's and we've got like a little bucket full of tadpoles. <laughs> and they're about to go into frogs very, very soon. I'm very, very exciting about that. Um and they it like jump, it hops along. And we go, no, 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 no. <laughs> you go for the seed. And I remember, and then there was actually this um, very, um, very strange moment um, yesterday, actually, when all of the goldfinches and the chicks were at the bottom of the feeder. And all the siskins were there and all the cold tits and the gray tits. Oh, wow. And then the magpie flew in. And every single one of the birds, even the ones that weren't parents, mm -hmm. for chicks, just turned <laughs> and, and just be and just like chased the magpie out. Oh wow, in. that's interesting. And I, I was just like, oh, oh. <laughs> so they will defend it even if it's not their own. Mm. And they did they, just all like there was like fifteen birds flew straight at the magpie. <laughs> That's amazing. Yeah, it was. It was. You could actually. You could just hear the entire. <laughs> you know, like the wing beats. They make like almost like a boom, and you could. <laughs> when they all took off, it was. It was an interesting experience. I do. It's. it's it is interesting if, you, if you've got that many birds. I always feel like a bodyguard. I'm constantly kind of patrolling the garden, like chasing. If I hear the wrens make their little alarm call. Or well, the robins, and I rush straight out and um, let's check that everybody's okay, and then chase away anybody that might be threatening them. <clears throat> so, sorry, I will go to questions shortly, but I just want to ask you what, uh, the one um, last thing, which is what's been, I think, really, really fascinating over the last few years. In a, in a way, as as world leaders, mostly have kind of, I feel personally abdicated the responsibility in terms of um, the sixth extinction um, that we're going through right now about climate change um, and also social justice issues um, as we're seeing right now and how many young people have stood up and been for one of a better way of putting it the adults in the room like the saying um, you know speaking sense, speaking rationally, speaking passionately, uh, Greta Thunberg, uh, yourself, um, uh, Bella Lack, amazing, amazing young people really um, uh, changing things. I mean, do you think that's a coincidence? Or do you think it's just of this time? Do you think it's something to do with social media? Why do you think that is? Or do you think pe young people are so fed up with the way adults are running the world? Well, it always does. Um, seem to be young people because young people are new into the world and mm. they're seeing how the world is and older people seem to almost see how the world was oh that's such a good way of putting it that's really interesting and i think that so you um young people are coming into this world and they're looking at this and they're going this is completely wrong Mm -hmm. Also, the fact that um, young people aren't really—they've got no bias. They've got haven't got really as much bias on this. They can see the problems in our world and just go. We can just see the problems and just go. That is wrong. Mm -hmm. And the, like, there's no real argument. It's just that is wrong. 
And I think that all the people, they go, oh, but it's been like this for ages and this is how the, the world is. Mm. This is just life. And young people just go, well, I don't want my life to be like that. <laughs> That's yeah. such a good way of putting it and so true, I think. And mm -hmm. Because, um, I mean, when you, do you feel hope when you think of the future? Do you think we can, that there's time for us if we all work together to change things? Well, I have to have hope. Mm. Humans have to have hope. And it's what drives us on. And so, wait a second. In the Greek mythology, um, there's the, it's one of the creation legends um, of with Pandora's box, which isn't actually it's a, a box, but a pithos. Um, it was um, Virgil got a mistranslation somewhere along the line and everybody called it a box after that point even though you don't really get boxes in Greece uh, sorry I'm getting off on a tangent no, right. <laughs> and Pandora opened up the box and all of the evil got out into the world and then she shut the lid and what she had let let but what was inside the box was um hope it was still trapped inside the box oh wow and, and Greeks, um, I, I think, well, the Greeks saw that as almost the hope was the, so the, there's two different variations of hope in Greek mythology. And in my opinion, mm -mm. The, the, the hope that was trapped in the box was the hope to follow that everything will turn out all right. And that you can always just go through life and and think and hope that everything will turn out for the best and not do anything about it. Mm -mm. And, and it was kind of, and it was like, so the Greeks saw that as almost the greatest monster of them all to be able to, to almost go through life. And I feel, and I think that almost has been unleashed upon the world, this apathy that the world will just sort itself out. Mm. You have a blind hope that the world will just sort itself out. Instead, my hope is that we take action to sort it out for ourselves and not try to wait it out and just hope that some miracle happens because in the laws of probability would say that that's not very likely. <laughs> I think that I, think that is such a beautiful way of putting it and and it's well that's how I feel very strongly that we apathy is our biggest enemy and hope is our biggest strength in a way you know we have to we can't wait for someone else to change the world we have to do it and and I think you know that often people get overwhelmed and think well there's so much wrong where do you begin but you can begin in such a small place, you know, you talk about, uh, you know, in in lockdown, like make, making a little pond and in yeah. you've made a pond in your garden, haven't you? But there's so many things. Whether you choose, I always say, whether you choose to adopt a cat or dog, or whether you choose to get one, yeah, from you know, whether you <laughs> choose to put out a tiny bowl of water for yeah. for uh, for birds in 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 um, the summer months. I mean, there's so many. There's so many things to do for free. Stopping to pick up a litter, whatever. There's things, but we all have to. I, yeah. I agree. Yeah. Hope, movement. Like my um, um, my dog Rosie. Wait, I can go where she's over here. Oh, there we go. <laughs> kind of, she's she's beautiful. Beautiful. <laughs> She was a. We rescued her. She was left on the side of the road with her twin sister, uh, and it. And we kind of, we gave her a forever home, <laughs> and she sleeps most of the day. <laughs> um, she's a perfect um uh, family dog because she kind of just um lies on the sofa or on her bed. <laughs> Um, and 
and she's also um we call her the 45 mile an hour couch potato because <laughs> <laughs> she's really really fast but also when she gets up <laughs> yeah when she gets up like if she decides to get up <laughs> oh that's so lovely um right i would uh, sh do you think we should um take some questions now if there is, uh, are we, Dana, are we able to take some questions? We are, we have a few of them, yeah. Are you um, going to read them? <laughs> What's the best way to do this? Yeah, yeah, I can just do that. Um, the first question, going back to your book, Dara, uh, Fred yeah. is asking, we got totally immersed in your family and the activities you did from wild swimming to trips, but you never seem to argue. Do you always get along so well? <laughs> um no <laughs> yeah <laughs> like, I, <In> word. <laughs> I think but we kind of we have a lot of debates and i think yeah. that i think that's just human that we, mm -hmm. we have to oh yeah we have to debate all the time oh, absolutely like if there, um, the same. like if there's something that i disagree about in um that we're all um talking about i will say it <laughs> <laughs> um i'm actually probably the chief um the chief um producer of arguments in the house <laughs> i will argue to the very last little detail of something <laughs> uh, I, I i really struggle with stopping it and how to like hold the brakes on an argument <laughs> um so yes, we do um, have the odd debate and arguments, but we're but we're all quite a t close knit group, all the same. Fair enough. That's family, I guess. Um, we also have a lot of questions about how you ride. Like, where's your favorite place to ride? Do you rather ride inside? Do you rather ride outside in nature? Sorry, what was that? What is your favorite place to ride? Like, do you rather ride inside or outside? Um, wherever there's a pen and a piece of paper. Yeah, I <laughs> In general, I will write anywhere, everywhere. Um, on my, like, I will have a notebook on my knee. If, if I, I'm required to do that, I will <laughs> write on the side of a wall. Um, <laughs> on a wall. You're the perfect writer. I will write any time, any place. <laughs> so, and I think you you kind of got to do that. Mm -hmm. And you've got yeah. the, uh, like if an idea comes to your mind, you just got to, I remember I had just, I sometimes I have these random ideas and I just go, okay, I've got an idea. <laughs> off, I'm writing for the day. <laughs> I mean, if you're so, you seem so passionate about writing, is there ever a time when you get bored of it? Um, well, considering it's so essential to um, my way of processing, like sometimes I can just get really, really tired if I've just been writing nonstop for a couple of days, then I can sort of go, sleep <laughs> um, because sleep is a thing that humans do need to do occasionally um they do yeah um that what are your like top writing tips for budding authors what would you tell other children who would like to become writers to get into it to get after um, write everything and anything that comes into your mind, no matter how rubbish it is, because most of the stuff that everybody writes is rubbish. Like, in all honesty, most of the stuff I, I write is rubbish. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think that's just, I think that's a thing. But if you get as so much, if you write so much, then eventually yeah. there's going to be some good, there's going to be some good stuff in there that you can sieve out. <laughs> I think that, that's such an important point with writing because I think, you know, it's if you've got a blank page, it's just a blank page. If you've got something, no matter how bad it is, you yeah. can of, often, even though you can't make any sense of it the first day that you write it, yeah. looking at it like two days later, you see, oh, actually that paragraph was really great, but yeah, I can see now the rest isn't any good. But you yeah. have that paragraph that you can build on. And I yeah. think 
a lot of people when I've taught writing have got this uh, this um, idea of perfection and I and mm -hmm. perfection is something you can you can work towards uh, in terms of as you refine things down but it's not something to start off yeah. with. to get the perfect paragraph to start your book with the perfect first page the first per per perfect first chapter uh, that stops so many people just keep writing yeah, and right, right and right perfection is almost a uh, unattainable goal mm -hmm. and it's i could have anyway, kept on refining diary of young naturalist for the next 10 years mm. <laughs> and kept on like going on oh, change this but then mm. you sort of get to this point where you've changed it so much that it's lost the original message mm. totally and it may be a literary piece of genius mm. but it doesn't have the message that makes it mm. powerful that's so that. true and it's so technically correct mm -hmm. that it's literally wrong in mm. so many ways. That's and you end up making right. something like, oh, yeah. that's like so sterile. Mm. And so mm -hmm. perfection is almost unattainable. Mm -hmm. And you don't want it if you actually manage to get to it. <laughs> mm -hmm. Exactly. I couldn't agree more. Any, uh, um, any other questions? Yeah. Um, I would say we have probably time for about two more. Um, I have a question from Beth, uh, which comes more to your love for animals. And she's asking, do you love all animals or are there, are there actually a few that you dislike? Um, hmm. Is there any that I harbor a dislike for? I don't know. I mean, I have a passion, hatred against mosquitoes, but that's me. <laughs> um. Like I could get frustrated by them. Oh yeah. But I still harbor some respect for them. I can get oh, frustrated but... by a lot of animals, but then, because uh, <laughs> sometimes you're like, oh, I really, really want to like you, but can you please <laughs> <laughs> not sting me? Yeah. Uh, yes. <laughs> um, I remember there was a short time where I, me and wasps did not get along very well. <laughs> um, that was because I wandered close to a wasp nest and I got about 20 stings. Wow. I stepped, um, they had like a nest on the ground and I stepped right beside it and then an entire cloud of wasps came after me. Oh my it God. had a bit of an enmity between us for a little bit there. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I think we've both gotten um, past that little pickup. Well, that's good. Like you're much better than me in that point then. <laughs> um, and last question from Chloe. So she's basically asking two things. So I'm guessing with your book being published, there's a lot of things that have happened for you in the last year. Looking backwards, is there anything you would like to tell your past self? And similarly, looking forward, what would you like to say to your future self to take out of this and remember? Oh, you've kind of gone to one of my most, in, um, one of my favorite topics of all time. <laughs> I love time so much. Uh, <laughs> it's, very, it's a very, very interesting topic. And But if I was to go back in time hmm. and tell myself something, I wouldn't tell myself anything because if I saw myself coming back in time, I would probably freak the hell out. <laughs> Yeah, I would mess up something. I would mess up something seriously bad. So if I <laughs> just, just like thinking about it, if I, if I was to if I was to do that, I'd be really caught. Like if I well, I how would I? I, I well, surely it has already happened. I'm <laughs> freaking out. Okay, so I'm just going off on a couple of um, tangents here about time paradoxes. Uh, <laughs> Oh, oh Wait, yeah. but, like, is there anything if you could leave a note? Like, is there anything you th or something you would have liked to know before going into all of this? Oh, I saw um Alice Hudson's chief is going um time doesn't actually exist. Uh, <laughs> um, oh, a queen of Sterigo, that's the guy who who put that one forward. I'm pretty sure. Yeah. Um, there there is 
time there is the physical change in the in the universe but but the measurement of time is human created but um but the but the universe still must have a development because there's a beginning and an end but time uh, itself is a human concept so everything happens for a reason and it's just how it is and we're just gonna roll with it and no <laughs> <laughs> fair enough um, uh, sorry can i just say something when when you were going through such a hard time at school yeah. and, and being bullied and and people um, struggling to have any self worth and um what would you going back and, and putting yourself in that space now the the what would you tell yourself then that that, that you know you've managed to it, it's so incredible what you've done when you've when you've you've have had such difficult moments that you because it takes actually a lot of courage to write any book and i th i think what you've done is phenomenal so is there any advice you'd give to to young people in a similar situation to you that that want to achieve something um so i was bullied quite a lot and i remember distinctly i base so basically i go i i decided okay i'm going to go into the frame of mind where bullies are saying that I they're, they're bullying me because I I love nature, but I love nature, so therefore their opinion that nature is stupid does not matter. Therefore, the bullies do not matter to themselves, and that, all their opinions before, from that point I point actually, are completely irrelevant. Mm -hmm. I actually think that it's really nice a point to end on because we're running out of time. <laughs> <laughs> okay, then. you're fair. Don't, um, can I just say it's such an unbelievable joy to talk to you. I hope so much that when all of this is over, that we can all we can do a proper well a, a, an in person literary festival. And yes, I'd love to meet. We will love to have you both in Barnes next year in person on the green in the sun, and then we can have this all over again. Uh, but until then, thank you so much for being here, and thank you so much for this really very very nice chat. And we hope you all check in our to our other events. We have Chris Riddell coming up in 15 minutes. The reason why we're kind of running out of time. Um, <laughs> okay. And, <laughs> uh, yeah, please, please, please check out the other events. And I hope to see you all very soon. Thank you. Bye, Dara. Bye. Thank you so much. Good chat. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you.